This meeting is being recorded. All right. Welcome to today's class. Um, how to find and win with buyers. All right. So this is a night class. I believe we're on session six or seven, I think six. Um, we're going to shake this one up a little bit. So we're not going to talk so much in the beginning about um, your daily 10-4. I'm not going to go around the room. I'm just going to briefly go over it. I need you guys to be doing this, right? This class is, is interactive, meaning this class needs to be partially learning-based as well as action-based. So things that we do each week, I want you guys to be doing and working on that week. So today we're going to talk about buyers. And so any nuggets that you get out of here, anything that you guys do, this is the week to focus on practicing those scripts. Um, if you have a buyer, you know, asking them some of these questions that you pull out of there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's, a, there's pretty big nuggets that are super basic, but if you, if you don't ask them, you're never gonna, feel, you're never gonna feel the, um, the weight of how simple some of the things that we're gonna talk about today are, that have such a big impact on setting that expectation with your buyer. So, without further ado, let's, let's jump into this. So, daily ten four, uh, for Candice and anybody on here, what that means is. Every single day, you should have some sort of metric around your lead generation. And the daily 10-4 is, is something that, probably going to get shunned for saying this, is something that if you're not ready to start with that intensity, don't. If you are, obviously do it. But for instance, if you're, if you're coming into this world and you've never once talked you know, to more than three different people a day, it's going to be very hard to do your daily 10 for if you come from a sales job or something else from your former life where you were talking to multiple different people, you know, you have all of that. Um, there it is. Um, then you, you may be able to start off with your 10 daily 10 for, but your daily 10 for is something you want to work up towards. All right. 10 contacts added to your database a day. Now, that's not necessarily 10 new contacts that you're going to talk to today. That's, that's because when you first get started, you have a database and everybody does, but no one really realizes it until we start going through it. it you, you have people in your phone saved as contacts. Those are contacts. Those are databases. You have to decide whether or not they're, they're, they're going to be uh, something that you want to you know, touch base with. But my rule of thumb is if they're in my phone and they're not in my database, why are they in my phone? So do, if I put up the, the, you know, the stance that everybody in my phone goes in my database and if not, I delete their contact. If I can consciously delete their contact, then yeah, they probably weren't meant for my database. But if I don't want them in my database, but I want to keep their phone number, it better be a darn good reason uh, for that, right? Um, maybe ex-wives. My ex-wife's going to be in my phone, but it's not going to be somebody I, you know, I touch in my database. So there are a few people, but for the most part, we all have a database, um, social media, you know, everybody's got a friends list, but everybody tells me they don't have a database. Then I would have to say, delete them off your friends list or consider them part of your database. So when you first get started, 10 contacts a day is manageable and it's something you have to do. Now being where Ricky's at, probably where Chad and Carson and, and Ed are at, um, maybe Jerry, I know, yeah, Jerry's probably at that since he's, you know, been doing this for a number of years in Ohio. We don't add 10 contacts a day. I don't add 10 contacts a day. My, my goal is to add 10 or two contacts a week. It's because we gotten started. We've already went through the, the, the minutia of 10. Why, why is it 10 a day instead of, Hey, day one, upload all your contacts. Humor me, Ricky. Answer me. I'm sorry. Question one more time. Sorry. I was just repeat. I was texting back a contact. <laughs> nope. You're good. Um, why, why do we start off with 10 a day instead of if somebody has 200, why don't, why don't they just do a hundred and then a hundred their first two days into real estate? Oh, cause you'll burn out and then you won't do anything for like a week. It, you'll burn out. You won't do anything for a week. You're creating bad habits. Right. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Yeah, exactly. The other reason 10 a day or five a day or two a day, depending upon your database, you decide. But the other reason for that is, is when you're adding to your database, you should be adding them to a smart plan, a touch program. Um, and so if you add a hundred people to your database in one day and add them to the same smart plan, then, you know, three months from now, when you have to do your quarterly call, you're going to get a hundred tasks in one day. 
versus breaking up your database into a quarter, you're going to have X amount of calls per day. So, um, you know, I, I give everybody the example of 200 person database built over a quarter. So four quarters in a year, 365 days in a year, there's 104 weekend days. Go ahead and delete those. There's 261 days left. Go ahead and give yourself three day weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So delete another 61 days. So you have 200 days, working days in a, in a year divided by four, you have 50 working days in a quarter. So that means if you have a 200 person database, you should be adding four people to the database a day because four times 50 is 200, which means I only need to call four people in my database a day, which means I only need to add four people to my database. I need to put them on a smart plan. So that way, three months from now, I call the same four people instead of a list of a hundred. So that's why it says 10 a day. 10 Bruce. connection. Oh, oh, somebody's got sorry. a question. Go for it. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> What's up? Um, I would just wanted to say that wouldn't it be um, more consistent if you added 10 a day instead of 100 a day? Like you can't consistently add 100 a day, you know? So just being consistent with your numbers, I mean, that seems manageable, like 10 or, you know. It, it gets you into bad habits, right? Um, that's why, like, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I really harp on people who start off in this industry uh, spending hours upon hours upon hours of system and foundational building because then they're not getting into the habit of lead generating so they'll spend you know two weeks so the first week two weeks three weeks four weeks all you know planning their business right onboarding watching training videos coming to classes da, 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 da. and then after month one they've got their foundation built and now the only thing they have to do is lead generate and no one's going to lead generate for eight hours a day right? And so you miss a golden opportunity. The other thing is, is when you start, you know, what you do today activity wise. And when I say activity, Candice, I mean, lead generation wise activities of adding your, adding people to your database from your phone. It's not an activity for me. It's a task. An activity is lead generation. If you go through one month of just system building and don't talk to anybody about you being in real estate, you make a couple of Facebook posts, it's just BS. You're not actually lead generating your marketing. If you get through a full month and you don't lead generate, you can't expect any sort of paycheck the next month or the next month because what we do today ends up coming back to us in 90 days. Um, so to start, I always say balance, right? We want to, you're, you're, the rule of thumb is you want to get to 80, 20, the 80, 20 principle, 80% 80 of your daily activities are some sort of lead generation tactics. So one of five, you're either closing on a property, negotiating that contract. If you have no properties to close and you have no properties to negotiate, you need to be showing and you need to be going on appointments and showing homes. If you're not doing that, you need to be doing lead follow-up. If you have no leads, you need to be doing lead gen. So everybody starts with number one and then they start to get some leads and then they work on those two. Those two are, are for a while. Everybody in this room can attest to that. Those two you have to do for a while before you start going on more appointments, before you go under contract and negotiate, before you close. So when you first start, I always recommend a balance of 50-50. If you're going to work eight hours today, you can only do four hours of, of, of uh, system building back end stuff. And the other four hours has to be lead generation oriented. And then what you start to do is you start to balance it out and you start to realize we don't work eight hour days. We might work four hour days, two hours of lead gen, two hours on the back end. The rest of the days are going on appointments, coffees, meeting up with people. Um, you know, maybe getting some more contacts, but through your daily life. Um, I personally never, ever, ever go through a bank drive through anymore. I go in the bank. I meet all the tellers. I never, ever, ever. Well, okay. Candace, the other thing you need to know about me is, is when I talk, I talk about myself three years from now or three years ago. So when I was at a high level, now I don't necessarily do all these things because I'm a coach. Right. Go through, don't go through the self checkout lines. Go, if you go to a, a, the same grocery store day in and day out, you're going to start to pick up on who's the full time employees. Go through their lines. I don't care if you have to wait an extra five minutes. 
because that extra five minutes causes you to wait in line. Waiting in line causes you to talk to somebody in front of you or behind you in line. Right. All of those things are being an, or a purposeful real estate agent. So you can get all your work done in about by noon and then go enjoy your life, right? Go on a hike, but invite a group of people to go on a hike. Right. You know, if you're going to go, uh, go grab a coffee, invite two people to go grab a coffee with you instead of by yourself. That's what our afternoons are for. That's what that kind of stuff is for. Now, let's pretend that you have a four hour, you know, class. We do have four hour update classes. Do you, you know, do you go do four hours worth of lead gen? Maybe, maybe not that day. Decide. But, but every day, two hours of lead generation, some way, shape or form because that's how you get your contacts really quickly. And I, and I hate to say it because I, I was one of these people. I didn't make my contacts. I didn't do any business for my first nine months in real estate. And it, it's, it, it hurts. And then I got purposeful. And then I realized that this is a contact sport. And the more contacts I make, the more leads I get. The more leads I get, the more leads I get to follow up with. Leads, to, I love lead follow-up. It's so easy. It's, not, it's just so much less nerve wracking for me. So that's what our daily 10 for is building up to a regiment, keeping it manageable and simple. Like I said, we're going to skip over this. All right. So on our funnel, right, we're talking about grabbing those leads. We're talking about setting appointments. So this, this class is called find and win with buyers. You guys all know me. The only way to find buyers is to, to hit more contacts, to hit more contacts, figure out your lead generation metric. We do a lead generation class. So um, in this class, there's so much that I need to go over with. We're not going to talk about finding buyers, but I am going to give, I'm going to shout out a quiz question and they give me five lead generation activities that you can find buyers or sellers through. Come on, Casey. Open houses. Boom. There we go. Somebody speak. Um, door knocking, cold calls. Door knocking, cold calls. Social media. I don't know. Social media. <laughs> what is social media? You describe to me what you mean by that. Are we lead like, generating or are we marketing? No, on social media, I just like, I feel like I just market. Like I'm not like, I reach out to people personally through like messages, but hey. sometimes it just uh, what do we call shows that? you. Who are you reaching out to? My friends and contacts. Who and new is that? Friends. My Who? database. <laughs> okay, perfect. This that's why I want to distinguish this because I got I got some people that have a, a social media as their lead generation thing on, um, on their on their business plan. So mm -hmm. talking to people you know, love, and trust who are already your friends on social media is just your sphere of influence. Adding new people to your, 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 your um, Facebook or your Instagram or whatever social media platforms, that's purpose. That, that's more lead generation, right? Dripping to your database can be some sort of lead generation, but more than anything, that's marketing to them. Adding people to your, 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 your Facebook, messaging them saying, hey, this is why I added you. That's lead generation. Um, so really good, Casey. So we got open houses, door knocking, cold calling, social media. I'm going to just go ahead and put that into uh, sphere of influence. What else? Events. Yep. Networking events, stuff like that. Perfect. Boom. Cool. Those are the five main ones. There's plenty of others, but those are what most activities will fall under. Okay. So again, we're not going to, we're not going to spend too much time on that. Let's get right into the bulk of this, this class. I love this one. Qualify and schedule your buyers for a consultation. All right. This is really important to start breaking this down. So let's fast forward. So we found the buyer. They told us they're a lead. We've got them on a touch program. We've got them in our database. That's kind of the point that we're at. Now, how do we set a consultation? How do we know the difference between a consultation and lead follow-up? Meaning... I go on appointments with buyers, but we don't do a consultation. I'm more just still getting engaged with that person. So how do we know when the right time to set the consultation is? Cool. Let me. Oh, I, don't yeah, I don't know. I don't know. 
<laughs> no, that that's okay. The when time that we to actually buying a house or looking for property when they're ready, I guess. I don't know. Oh, yeah, you guys both like hit the nail on the head right there. Four to six months out. No, I don't believe that that's my consultation piece. Good. Really, really good on distinguishing what I'm talking about. The difference being. So if Ricky's six months away from buying a house and I say, Ricky, we need to, we need to meet up and we need to talk about what, what's going to happen when you buy a house. I'm not going to do my consultation. I'm going to do an expectation setting meeting or a, a lead follow-up. So I'm in that meeting, I'm just going to talk about what the timeline looks like, right? We're going to be getting started in a couple of months, which means we need to make sure you're prepared to talk to a lender. We need to make sure you have some down payment. We need to make sure that you understand that when the time comes, we're going to need another sit down for about an hour to an hour and a half. And that's when we're going to go over the whole buying process. Now, in this meeting, I might get some, some criteria from Ricky, but I'm going to solidify that criteria in the actual consultation. So a consultation should be had right before they're going to start taking action. Consultation should be had when you can consciously realize that that person, whatever you're going to give them is going to be something that sticks in their mind. Because if I talk to Ricky six months before he's gonna close on a house and we're gonna get started three to four months before, that means he's got two, I'm gonna give him an hour and a half conversation. And then in two months from now, I have to expect him to remember that. I'm going to have to, he's going to ask me the same questions. He's going to go over, we're going to go over the same things. In two months, he's not going to know what earnest money is and how it works. In two months, he's going to have questions around what the inspection, what the inspection looks like. He's going to forget what it costs to, to pay for that. So I'm not going to go through any of that, but I'm still going to have a meeting with Ricky, especially if anybody wants to get face to face with you and they're a lead, do it, do it. Even if they're a lead that you are like, that, that's hesitant about even making a move, do it. Because the worst case scenario is you just build a relationship even more. So the reason why this is called qualifying and schedule your, schedule your buyers is <laughs> the only way to really have an effective consultation is to do it in which they remember and start taking action. So we got to time it up to the point where they're about ready to take action. Go ahead, Erica, or um, Casey. You know, you're the second person that's called me Erica. <laughs> well, do you know why? Because Erica's I know, last, her name, last is Casey. name is Casey. Yeah. I know. I know. That's so funny. Tyler called me and he goes, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, it's yeah. okay. Um, I just wanted to say, can you just make it a little bit bigger, like zoom up on the your screen by chance? Oh, yes. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm... I can't. I, I don't know. If... Nope. I'm glad I, you guys need to tell me that because I just see a huge screen, so. Yeah, that's a lot better for yep. me at least i don't know yeah qualify them are they actual buyers all right that's what i see a lot of us defining appointments in our or, i see a lot of us so we use a lot of different words in this industry and, it, and it's perfectly fine what it is is you got to define that for yourself for me a consultation is more of the appointment A face-to-face -face is more of just a follow-up or a relationship building thing. Some people, I call it face-to-face -face or belly-to-belly. -belly. So if I'm going to meet up with Ricky and he's six months away, that's, I'm, just, I'm going on a face-to-face. -face. If I'm going to meet up with Ricky and I'm going to do a full-blown buyer's consultation, that's an appointment. But that's, that's what Bruce defines as his business, business metrics. You can't, you got to define that because the person who call, qualifies a belly to belly or a face to face in my world as an appointment, as well as classifies a listing presentation or a buyer consultation as an appointment, their ratios are just going to be off a little bit, but they're not going to be off. It's just going to be a metric that you have to know. That's the main reason why I distinguish between appointments and face to face, because I can't necessarily figure out what my percentage from a consultation to 
under contract really is if I'm adding in, you know, just follow-up appointments and coffees and stuff like that. So that's why I do it that way. You can do it the other way. Just know that your metric is going to be a little different. Okay. So how do we qualify? How do we know whether or not we're going to walk into a buyer's consultation? Right. It's through qualifying. How, what's the best way we can qualify? What's the number one thing we do on the phone to qualify? Ricky and I went over this in scripts this morning. Is it statements or is it questions? Questions. Exactly. Right. They call them qualifying questions, the Q and Q. So, how do we qualify a buyer? Who wants to role play with me? You guys don't have to raise your hand at all. I, won't. I can do it. Yes, you can. Are you are you trying to do for like um to see if you're ready to set the appointment or to see if they're ready to? Is that what you mean? Exactly, exactly. So oh, okay. Ricky's gonna Ricky's gonna humor me. Okay, I'm gonna ask him a lot of questions, and I just want some short answers. But I want to see, I want you guys to see how I qualify a buyer. All right. So let's set the stage for this. Ricky's been a lead of mine. Right, because we don't want to talk about we just got a lead because that conversation is going to be lead follow up. Ricky said Ricky's was a lead of mine. He was a lead of mine in the yeah the beginning of the year. He reached out to me right after the New Year's and said, "Bruce, I'm going to be buying a home. I want to close on a home in the next six months, meaning call it June June first or whatever." All right. So now it's been two months. We're right at the end of February. This is when I'm going to start to set the consultation. I'm going to validate everything that Ricky told me he's going to start to do. Ricky is going to be eager to set an appointment with me, but I'm not going to set it until I know he's ready. Okay. Ring, ring. Hey, Bruce. Hey, Ricky. What's going on, man? How are you? Oh, man, not too much. Just, uh, well, working today. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Hey, as promised from when we spoke in January, um, I told you I'd give you a call about four months before, you know, we were, you were going to be ready to close on a home because like we walked through last time, um, you know, it, it can be about a four month process for you to get into a home. Can I ask you a quick question? Do you remember how long it takes for us to go under contract on a home and then in order to close the average time frame? I think you said a couple months. Uh, 30 to 45 days. Okay. So again, the reason why I'm calling today, and if you have a couple of minutes, I, I would love to just ask you a few more questions before we sit down and we go through, you know, everything there is to know about buying a home. So if you yeah, want to be yeah, in a home around the beginning of June and we work backwards about 45 days, um, that puts us in the middle of April, right? And that's uh -huh. really going under contract. And, and before we spoke, you talked about um, needing, uh, you know, a few weeks to probably take a look at some homes. Well, I'm here to tell you uh, that the market is, is still pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's ever turning right now. Meaning once a home goes on the market, it's, it's going under contract pretty quickly. So my suggestion is that we give ourselves a few more weeks just in case. All right. Um, so is it okay with you if we give ourselves maybe like a month or like let's call it four weekends to really get out there and take a look and make offers on homes? Yeah, sure. Okay, see that statement question? No, that, that's great. So according to our timeline, then that puts us where? Uh, so we're talking about the middle of April. So that puts us in the middle of March. It's now February 23rd, my friend. It's time for us to get this ball rolling. Don't you agree? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have any thought about it like that. Yeah, no, I know. Because June seems so far away. Because June, I, what, what do you think in June? I think t-shirt shorts. I think the sun's shining early in the morning. It's going down late at night. And here we are in the frigid cold, four degrees. Uh, yeah, my friend, that's why I do what I do. I, I pride myself on helping you get into a home at your leisure. So let me ask you this. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, um, you know, are you committed to sitting down with me and going over like, you know, what, what we're going to do while we go throughout this buyer's process? Yeah, no, I think that that'd be awesome. Um, when do you think you could do it? Just because I know I got a pretty busy schedule, but. Right on. Yeah, we'll get to that at the end of this year for sure. Uh, we'll, we'll set a plan in motion. I'll get I'll open my calendar. Um, okay. Another question for you is, is um, how much money do you have saved up for a down payment? Oh, right now I am sitting at about 20,000. 
about 20,000. Okay, perfect. And um, do you still have that list of lenders? Do I need to, do I need to bring that to our meeting or should I send that over to you after I get off the phone here? So it, it's top of your, it's at the top of your email. Uh, no, I've, uh, I've been talking with um, that one lender pretty consistently. I haven't talked to the other ones, but no, we've been in touch. Perfect. All right. Do, um, you know, do I have your permission then to reach out maybe through a, you know, a group email to get that ball rolling so that way that lender knows that the time is now to start running that process through with your credit, your debt to income and all of that stuff? Uh, yeah, definitely. That'd be okay. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And the reason why I asked Ricky is because if you're not ready, then I, I don't know how effective our, our, our meeting will be. You see, um, the most effective buy a consultation that we can have about buying the home is talking about buying the home because the lender really needs to talk to you about lending money for the home. And so if you could do me a favor and, and just, you know, make a commitment to me, do you think you can, you know, start to engage with that lender um, before we sit down and talk about the home buying process? If not, that's okay. I'm just letting you know, it's going to be a much more effective conversation. And honestly, it'll take us less time because like I said, they're the ones who are the experts in the finance world. Yeah, absolutely. We actually just talked last week. He uh, gave me just a follow up call. So nice. And did he did he explain to you the difference between a pre approval and a um, uh, a pre approval and a pre qualification? Yeah, he actually went through that with me while while we we're on the phone there. So nice. That's all. That's awesome. Okay, that's why I set you up with lenders like that because there's a big difference. You know, what's the number one difference between those two? Do you remember? Uh, well, basically, the pre-qualification is the one that I need when I'm shopping, right? I, like um, the pre-approval letter. A little different. A like... little different, actually. So okay. um, in most situations, a pre-qualification is one in which the lender just asked you some questions over the phone or you typed in some information yourself. And based upon that information given to the lender, they would say that, yeah, if everything that you said is to be true, will pre we are pre-qualified now a pre-approval is approving and all of the supporting documents that you are going to have to submit to the lender to basically validate everything that you answered in their application so a pre-approval is oh, the right one we need right yeah Sorry, man. <laughs> confused there but yeah that's that's the one that we needed and, that, and that's okay. And that's perfectly fine. Because some lenders do call a pre-approval a pre-qual. They don't actually use the word pre-approval. They just call everything a pre-qualification. So a pre-qualification in my world and in the real estate world, remember the finance world and, and, our, and my world are two different things. They just work uh, synonymously together. Uh, pre-approval is the best way to go out and shop for a home because a pre-qualification is like going out with a, with a gun, hunting, but you have no ammunition. I mean, you have no, you have, you have nothing to actually take down the, 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 the kill. Having a pre, a pre approval looking at some homes is much like a loaded gun going out to hunt. You're ready. You're ready to take that, that, that thing down versus meaning you're ready to make an offer on a property. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. Talk with them about that. Let's get going on that. And so, um, yeah, we need to, we need to find a time that you commit to about an hour and a half. Um, we're going to go over a lot of nitty gritty questions. We're going to go over a lot of things about the market and I really am going to hone in on your criteria. So about three main things we're going to go over, uh, but there is going to be some time we need to block out. So it looks like I have um, this coming Thursday at six o'clock available or Saturday at two. Which one will work better for you? Yeah, here, let me just check my schedule. Uh, yada, yeah, yada, I can, yada. I can Pause. do Thursday. Cool. So um, rule number one, always, always, always know your schedule. Every time you get on the phone, you need to at least have two, two appointments that you have open in your calendar ready. And the reason being is, is you are the professional, right? You don't call the doctor's office and say, I want to, I want to come in tonight at 7 PM. You call the doctor's office and you say, when can I get in? Be the, be the professional, right? The attorney is not going to sit down with you. Uh, you know, they're going to give you some times that they're available and you're going to have to choose, right? If we're going to be the professional to our, our clients, we need to act like the professional. So I have, two, I have two appointments. If Ricky can't do either of those two, 
I'm going to be the one finding the next couple of options. I'm not going to say, well, what does he, what do you have available? And I'll see if I can make it work. Right. That's too much control given back to the client. We don't, we want the client to have some control, but we want to control the dialogue and the conversation. Okay. Questions on how to qualify. So if we were to break down qualifying into just a couple, like one, two, three, what are the things that you need for, to be a qualified buyer? I love that you asked that. Ready, willing, able. That's what I just did with you right there. Is your timeline still the same? Right? So based upon your timeline still being the same, we work our way backwards. Are you ready to meet with me? Willing. Or yeah, are you willing? Yeah, sorry. Are you willing to meet with me? Oh, well. <laughs> right. right. And then are you able to? Right. Able is, is okay. The timeline's still the same. Like he said, he's got a busy work schedule. So I'm picking him right now. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready to meet with you. But I, I, I'm going on vacation. I'm, I've got a big project at work that I'm working 12-hour days with. Where's the able part? Right. If I'm not seeing signs of able, here's what I'm going to start to ask. Ricky, th this is really important to you, right? He's going to say, yeah. Yeah, say, absolutely. It's important to me too. And, and here's, the, here's the hardest part about my industry is that by doing this, you are going to have to make some time commitments outside of your normal day to day. It sounds like in the next couple of weeks, you're not going to be able to do that. So let me ask you, if the ability for you not to be able to take some time away from your, your work life and your personal life to make this happen, what's going to happen if I can't get you into a home by June 1? Are you going to be upset with yourself and myself? Well, um, yeah. I mean, honestly, because then I'd need to probably find or get on another lease or find a short term or something like that. And that that's, doesn't sound like it's an option for you, does it? Is it? I mean, theoretically, I could make it work, but then I'd be digging into the money I have to buy a home. So I'd like to avoid it if possible. Okay. So let me ask you this. Should we hold off on meeting for another few weeks and take that risk if you happen to maybe set up another lease? Or do you think you can meet with me Saturday at two um, to, to make this happen and get this ball rolling? Well, yeah, no, I, um, I'll definitely you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make some time. So I'll be there. Yeah. Perfect. We can do I it. got the able. Okay. I'm glad you asked that. That's pretty much what I was going to go into. So Ricky tells me that, um, you know, the time and now became flexible. Well, actually Bruce, um, you know, June one is no longer kind of, uh, uh it's no longer the target date. I kind of have a moving target date now. Oh, really? Why? What, what happened? Well, my, my landlord told me that I could go month to month. And I, I, I basically signed and said that, you know, I would go month to month because I'm pretty nervous about buying a home, to be honest with you. There's no homes out there. Every time I see something I like, it sells for way more than I'm willing to afford and spend. So I decided to go month to month. So that way I can kind of watch the market. What do you say there? He's not ready. He's not ready at all. Can I get him to be ready? Maybe, but he just removed his motivation. So the strongest motivation in everything that we do is a time constraint motivation, right? My grandma or my, my mother passed away and I'm the only, I'm the only offspring that's going to go help them. And my dad needs to me to be out there to, to help with X, Y, and Z, you know, before the spring. So you don't have a date, but you've got this. You've got a motivation. And I'm going to ask because I want a date. I, I, Bruce wants a date. And if I can't get a date and somebody says spring, I'm going to say, well, what's going to happen if you're not you know, in Iowa taking care of your dad by June? Nope, there, that's, not, that's not an option. My dad can't take care of himself. I should really be there now. Great. When can we meet for a consultation? I've got everything I need. But well, you know, my dad, you know, he's just, he's just starting to go downhill. You know, honestly, if, you know, if it, yeah, if it became like June, July, August, you know, he, he's going to be fine. It's really the winter months 
that I really need to be there to shovel the sidewalk, to make sure I get him to this doctor's appointments. You know, he's still capable and able. And, you know, so, yeah, I would say that, you know, the timeline definitely is, you know, immediate. I definitely want to do this now, but I could probably give myself until August. Well, let me ask you, Ricky, are, are we doing this now or are we waiting until August? See, well, all fine. Now. Perfect. I just want a commitment, right? Okay. That means, that means you're ready. Even though we don't have that time that I'm looking for, you're ready because you just committed and you're willing because we're setting that appointment and you're able because you're financially have $20,000 and you're talking to a lender. But I asked Ricky that same question, Ricky. So it sounds like you're ready now. It sounds like we should do this. So if we meet today, are you willing to get in the car with me next week to go look at homes? Because the last thing I want to do is fill your mind with a bunch of information on Saturday and then have you wait a, a few months because I'm just going to be wasting your time, my friend, because I'm going to go over so much that you're not going to be able to retain it in the next couple of months. Heck, it took me several months to go through my license law, and then it took me about nine months to actually start to do this business. So everything I talked to you today, we really can't wait those extra two months before you start. So what is your, where's your commitment at? All of those questions, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that, right? Now let's go in the reverse, all right? What if, what if uh, um, I'm ready and I'm willing, but I'm not able? Well, uh, Bruce, yeah, no, I really want to find a house, but you know, I, I ran into some, a situation where my sister got into a car accident and she, she needed to borrow about $10,000. And so I've got about $10,000 um, to my name right now to buy a house. Hey, you know what? Let's hold off on setting this, this meeting, but better yet, let's go ahead and set a meeting with the lender because there are some down payment assistance programs. There are some things out there that could cause you to still be able to buy a house. Are you willing to talk to a lender to see if you can do that now with 10 grand or do you need to save up another 10 grand before we get started? Well, I really prefer to save up another 10 grand. I, I don't really know about those home buyer programs and you know, nothing's, nothing's free in this world. So I know I'm gonna have to pay for it. Well, to be honest with you, what is paying for something? You know, if I could get you into a home with a down payment assistance program, one in which you start paying down your own mortgage, meaning your own principal balance, wouldn't that be better uh, to pay maybe a slightly uh, higher interest rate than continuing to pay rent for the next year and giving all of that money to somebody else's principal? Yeah, I suppose that that's a good point. <laughs> Thanks. I wasn't expecting, I was, I was waiting for, I saw some people writing down that question. That's how good you have to get you guys with questions. You have to figure out the, the, the timeline. You have to qualify and dig deep. If you can't do that, you're, here's what's going to happen. Ricky, man, what's going on? It's Bruce. And, um, you know, it's been two months. Holy crap. So that means we only have four months left before you're looking to buy a home. You, you still thinking about June 1? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, hey, it's time for us to meet. Like we said, we're going to get started about four months before we really need to be into a home. So do you have time to meet uh, Thursday or Saturday, blah, blah, blah? And then we set an appointment. And then what happens? Bruce pumps. I go down the office. I ring the freaking bell. I got my appointment set. <laughs> and then Saturday at two, I'm missing the, I'm missing the Michigan football game. Um, my family wants to have a barbecue and my daughter wants me to play at the park, but I can't do any of that because I set an appointment with Ricky and Ricky. And I'm very excited about that. And I'm pushing everybody out of my family, out of my friend's circle of life. And I'm going to make my job happen. And I sit down with Ricky. And Ricky goes, hey, Bruce, you know, you told me to ask, you told me to bring some questions to our meeting today. Um, I forgot to tell you that my sister actually uh, got into a car accident. She needed to borrow about 10 grand worth of uh, cash. And the lender that I'm talking to, uh, he just told me uh, late uh, yesterday that um, because I don't have that cash, there's really not going to be a down payment assistance program that's going to work for him. Um, so I, I think I got to actually push my timeline out, but I, I do appreciate you meeting with me because I, I do still want to go over some of this stuff because I just need to wrap my head around how this is going to go. Not the way to run your business. See how that goes, you guys? Qualify, ready, willing, and able. What kind of questions can I ask around that? 
you guys pull any nuggets out of that? We we hit home. Uh, we hit we hit a large portion of qualification. Okay. So whenever your potential buyer is not willing to meet with a lender yet, then mm -hmm. do you just kind of tread water with them and come back and circle with them later? Yeah, let's go through that. Let's go through that. Uh, Jerry. <laughs> Ricky, I do the same thing because uh, my sister's uh, my sister's dad's name is uh, Jerry with a J. And so I see G and I think Gary too. <laughs> no problem. Call me whatever you want. <laughs> I'm just not late to dinner, right? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, um, so Jerry, um, help me under, so, sorry. Uh, so, so Jerry, yeah, let's meet, let's do all this stuff, yada, yada. And you just told me, tell, say it again. Sorry. I haven't met with the lender yet. And uh, uh, what, why is that so important? Okay, perfect. Yeah, it, it's important because what it's going to do is it's going to save us time. You see, if you go and talk with me for about two hours on Saturday when you could be at home with your family or your kids or watching the ball game and we meet and then you go and talk to a lender and they, they basically say, look, you know, you're going to have to build up your credit or you're going to have to save a little bit more money for a down payment um, and you're not going to be able to buy for another six months. I, I just don't want to waste your time. Um, now, if you have some money saved and you've done this before and you've got a steady job, I'm happy to meet with you. Okay. So well, basic, basically what it is, is I'm, I'm happy to still meet and do a buyer's consultation, even if they haven't met, even if they haven't talked to a lender, I'm just going to push the importance of it hard. And I'm always going to, my a buyer's consultation does not need to be set the next day. Very rarely do you get that phone call that says, hey, Bruce, I actually got the day off tomorrow. Do you think we can meet? Hey, if you got the day off tomorrow, why don't we meet in the afternoon? And since you have the full day off, why don't tonight you fill out the lending application, submit it to the lender sometime this evening. And then that way, by tomorrow, we might at least get a pre-qualification. Sounds yeah. good. If they say, well, no, I really, I really want to meet with you first. Well, help me understand. I know you want to meet with me first. Is there somebody that told you you have to meet with an agent first before the lender? Hmm. You see, asking those questions, you can you can make sure that they're they that that you go from A to B instead of A to D. You don't put that cart in front of the horse. Yeah, but if they say if they say, well, yeah, no, I actually I, I could try and get the application done. Uh, but since I have the day off, I decided to uh, you know take the kiddos down to Great Wolf Lodge in Colorado Springs. And so, yeah, I could meet up with you tomorrow because we're going to go down. Um, you know, it's only 10 o'clock this morning. So we're going to go down, have a good night, and then we'll drive back sometime in the morning um, and then I'll meet with you. Hey, great. Do you mind if I bring the lender along or do you mind if I send over the, uh, you know, the application? If you're at the pool and just, you know, chilling and watching your kids play, do you think maybe you could fill it out? I'd try another ditch effort. Maybe we get all sorts of different stuff, but yeah. here's what so I, Bruce, here's what I, go ahead. Um, I guess an important distinction just to kind of circle back to what you said earlier is you can still meet with them and get deaf. Well, not can still, you should definitely still meet with them in person just to get belly to belly with them. Even if they end yes. up being six months out and, yes. you know, try to set that up, but you don't have to change your whole life around it. Work that into the schedule at some time that's convenient for you, but that's going to help you really build up the trust. Cause otherwise I've run in, I ran into the problem of the last year of being like, you know, not saying it like in a mean way, but basically being like, look, I'm not going to meet with you until you have that pre you know, like until you're like pre-approved and it shot me in the foot, you know, lose clients like that. Perfect. Exactly. And that's where I'll still meet with, I'll still meet with Jerry, but I'm not going to go down the hallway and ring the bell. Like I got an appointment, right? I'm going to see, I'm going to, I'm going to be ready for the consultation, but I'm going to, I put my mindset on, this is just a face-to-face. -face. Cause anytime you get your, your hopes up and then they get crushed, you end up not wanting to do the work the next day. But mm -hmm. if you set yourself up for, okay, great. This is a belly to belly it sucks. We're not having a consultation, but I'm kicking the can down the road instead of leaving the can in the gutter behind, right? It's still a viable lead. Let's rock and roll. 
I'm just not going to get excited, right? The other thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to offer Saturday at two. Nope. You are not, you are, I am not having a face-to-face, -face, a belly-to-belly -belly with somebody Saturday at two, unless one, we're drinking beer. Two, we're watching a ball game. Three, we're going on a hike. Four, they're buying me lunch. Five, they're my good friend and we're not really going to talk a lot about real estate. You see how that works? If I'm just belly to belly and we're only, and I don't barely know this person and we're talking about real estate, but it's not a consultation, you better fit between nine and five Monday through Friday. And if not, we're going to jump on Zoom after hours. That's where Bruce got. I used to take those appointments all the time, you guys. I, I used to do it. And I wasn't a business owner, you know? When's the last time you guys were like, damn, I'm hungry. I really want to go to my favorite cafe, uh, but it's four o'clock in the afternoon and they just closed at three. I know the owner and I know he's, I know he's still there closing down shop. Maybe I should just give him a call to see if I can see if I can go there at four. Maybe he'll whip me up something great for lunch. When's the last time you guys did that? Okay. Why don't you do that? Because you know they're business owners. You look at them as a professional owner. Look at yourselves the same way. I used to do that, you guys. I got very burnt out and very frustrated with myself. So if I'm going to meet with somebody on the weekend and it's just a face-to-face, -face, it's not just a coffee about real estate. We're going to go hiking. We're going we're gonna to go to Meow Wolf. We're going to go and... You know, you name it, we're going to go do something and we're going to, we're going to bring in that conversation. Okay. Does that answer your question, Jerry? Yes. Thank you. Cause I, I got two buyers that are, they're just uh, dragging their feet for, they have money in the bank and, and, but they're just not getting that pre-qual letter for letter. Okay. What's their timeline? Well, one of them says this fall and the other one hasn't built a timeline. See how that works? Yeah. Timeline equals motivation. If I don't have a timeline, there's no such thing as a consultation coming out of this guy's mouth because timelines make people act, right? So yep. Emotion. All right. So well, let's go through last a couple comment was, I'll know it whenever you send me the right property. <laughs> yep. And so... I love that. Hang on to that. All right. I'm going to go get some more water. It's about 10 o'clock. We've got another hour of this and we've only gotten to qualification. You guys take notes. Uh, let's jump back on here at uh, 10 o'clock. All right. So that's that's pretty much how we can qualify a buyer. Find those questions around ready, willing, and able. So action item. Remember, we talked about this. Action item for you guys this week is try and think of three to five to 10 questions around each of those metrics. It's going to make your brain think, right? We, we kind of go through this in scripting and we kind of go through this in some of the, the classes and stuff, but our brains can only consciously hold so much stuff. That's why we write down to-do lists because if we don't write it down on a to-do list, the moment that we need to think about it, we may not, right? Same thing with questions. You might have a decent, you know, a, a, a basic bullet pointed list for maybe one or two questions around each of these. Once you write those down and start digging deeper into your brain and into yourself, you might find that you might come up with questions that are better suited for you, that hit home for you, that are more um, uh, engaging around that subject. So that would be an action item from this Ignite to the next week's. All right, let's get into um, some of Jerry's some of Jerry's things. Um, I, I was overhearing Ricky, and that was that was great. The the the, the like I said, the key is is ready, willing, and able, and what makes people act is a timeline. People that are just thinking about selling their home without any sort of real motivation, selling your home is a process for a seller. And it's not fun. 
selling your home is so much the opposite of enjoyment as a buyer side. Buyers are get excited, right? It's a process. It's still daunting. They hate getting their lender pre-approval. They hate getting their offers rejected and beat out. But it, all in all, they get excited every time they put a showing together. They get excited when they go under contract. They get excited to move in. They're excited. Sellers, they got to fix up some things on their house. They're embarrassed by how they let their house get because of the transition. They've got to think about packing all their stuff up and moving. They have to think about all the strangers that are going to be in their house. They have to think about how inspections are going to go because they know there's things wrong with their house that they don't really want to fix while they were living there. So now they don't really want to fix it when a buyer requests it. So a seller has to have that timeline motivation. It's very, very, very rare when I can convince a seller to sell without some sort of time frame. But there's, there's things that we can do to help us qualify. So we talked about the qualification kind of process and, and our conversation. Now let's talk about how you can get into good business with your leads, right? We talk about the pipeline. Before we talk about the pipeline, I want to talk to you guys about a whiteboard, all right? I used to have a big whiteboard, uh, like, I don't know, it's probably like three by four. Um, I think I had a four by six at one time. It was huge. And what you do is you jump on Amazon, go to Hobby Lobby, and you're looking for this stuff called, uh, maybe not double-sided, but you're looking for something that looks very, very, very similar to this. Maybe not so much this masking tape, because that's about an inch wide, but this stuff here, you can get at about a six millimeter wide stance. And it's it's like kind of like electrical tape. It keeps coming up double-sided, but it's kind of like electrical tape. And um, I used to get mine at Hobby Lobby, Office Max, stuff like that. And it, you can make grids on your whiteboard, all right? Just like an Excel spreadsheet. So now let me show you guys what a pipeline is. And here's another action item. Watch the pipeline video. We're gonna go through it quite a bit today. Um, crap, what was it? All right. Ooh, error. Well, I guess I'm gonna be explaining it to you then. All right, so this pipeline too, I'll download it and I'll put it in the chat for you guys. This pipeline tool is basically a very good emotional control for you. We get all, we get leads, we get all excited. Gary, are you excited about your leads? Yeah, everybody, you should be always, excited about your always. leads, right? You're always excited about it. But how do we keep our excitement in check? We do it through basically grading or classifying our leads. So this is the pipeline. Get it nice and big here for Miss Casey. All right. So this is the grid that I would that I built on a visual whiteboard. The visual whiteboard helped me because every time I came into the office, I could see my leads. I could feel the angst of when I watched somebody's name and I went, oh my gosh, I was supposed to call them last week and I didn't call them last week. Oh crap. I also, like I said, it's an emotional checker, meaning I can get excited about a lead, but I'm not going to get my hopes up because of how I grade them. So I'm going to put in my appointment date. If you don't have an appointment date, leave it blank. Address, here's what I did. I, I eliminated address and I put on there, well, for sellers, you put the address, but for buyers, you want to make two of these. I put um, the area area that they're going to be searching, right? If, it, if I don't really know, I just put Northern Colorado. If I know they're going to be looking in Longmont and surrounding, I'll put that, yada, yada, yada. Obviously their name, contact information. And then I like this, next steps and notes. I personally don't put a lot of notes in here because that's what my CRM is for. I do not want my pipeline to be a CRM. I want my pipeline to be a living, breathing lead follow-up machine. And here's what I mean by living and breathing. 
the rating. Okay. I want you guys to read this. Total number of tens appointments. You're going to be listing them this month. Okay. So this rating system, this is the key crucial component to this pipeline tool. If they're a 10, the only way that you can mark somebody as a 10 is if you have a listing agreement signed and that listing is gonna go live this month unless something catastrophic happens. For a buyer side, they can only be a 10 if you're actively looking at houses. There are houses that meet their criteria popping up on the market consistently. And they're making offers. They're not afraid to make an offer. The buyer consultation has already been there. So can you guys understand and see why most of the time, anybody that you put on a buyer or seller pipeline is only a 10 for a very small portion of time? Because if they're a 10, that means they are your, they are your ever, they are your ever focused around leads because they're out showing houses. The sellers are, are you're going to, you've got a listing agreement signed and we're only simply waiting on them listing the home or photos or the process is begun, right? I strive for seven, eights, and nines because tens are pretty much slam dunks. I already got them all the way there. I want seven, eights, and nines. Seven, eights, and nines are the most important for me. So a nine on a listing side is they're gonna be they're gonna be listing their home the next month. Remember, everything usually has a timeline. Usually you list a home based upon the market and based upon the time that they need to get the home sold. In this market, we can basically tell our sellers, look, if you list it right, I can have your home closed and sold in about 45 days from the moment we list it. But we only have two weeks of inventory. A normal market is six months of inventory. That means on average, a listing can sit for about four to six months. So if I have somebody getting a new job and they're going to be starting their new job next fall, then in that market, I'm going to say, we need to list today. You know, the, the odds of you going under contract are against you right away. If, they, if you do go under contract, we'll see if we can find a buyer who's willing to wait for your time frame. But the last thing I want you to do, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, is wait until about a 45 days before you need to be in New Mexico for your job to list your home. In this market, different story, right? So pipeline also, you, get, you, you label them with numbers based upon the market, right? A buyer in this market very rarely is a 10. I just don't even like putting a 10 because I feel like it's putting bad juju out there. They're a nine, even if they're out there looking at properties with me because they're likely to get beat out. So it, it, this is about you and how you grade it, but it's really to keep your emotions in check. So a listing, I'm going to be listing it in March sometime. There are nine. A buyer lead. They're, 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 I got their four-month timeline backed up. We're already in that process. A nine is somebody who is already working with a, 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 a lender and has done the buyer's consultation, but we still got, they're not hot and heavy into looking at homes. They haven't even made an offer on anything, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to, we're going to do our first showing. An eight is somebody who might be a month or two out, seven, three or three or so months out, right? I also am looking at ready, willing, and able. So it, let's say that I have a buyer who is willing to buy a house, whose timeline is coming up, meaning they're ready, but they're having some issues with their credit. And the lender is kind of a little weary about them. Well, they go from an eight to a nine, even though their timeline says nine, even though their willingness says, says um, nine, their ability to do this says eight. We're still working on some things. So you see how it's not all about the months. This is just a good rule of thumb. This is kind of your baseline. Why did I say I'm looking for somebody seven, eight, and nine? Why, do, why does that my ever focus and not six, seven, eight, and nine or not eight and nine? Why is that? Uh, I think that- You have a definite just, time. Yeah. I think they're more likely to make a move sooner, the more ready, willing, and able. 
I guess. Yeah. More than anything, like I said, anybody that is more than about four months away on a buy side, their situation can change at a moment. Anybody on the sell side, I do like to be within that one to three months, but I'll still give a sell side four months, let's call it. But their timeline or their things can change, right? And then you notice a six, it goes to good, a good meeting. I don't say a good, a good consultation or presentation. It says good meeting. These are your face to faces, your belly to bellies, right? These are your, these are your, these are your five, six, seven, eight months out. I wouldn't even go eight months. I'd go five, six months out. All right. Then you drop down here, five or less. It just says appointments. Just appointments it means you probably had a face to face with them. You probably got a good inclination on what they're going to do. Why, why are there no four fives or why are there no five, four, three, two, one or four, three, two, one? Because if they don't classify in any one of these categories, you should not be touching them more than once a month. A six, I'm probably looking at maybe bi-weekly to maybe once every third week. Once a month might be a little too long for that person, but once a week might be too strong for that person. Seven, eights, and nines? Yeah, you're, you're probably getting a call from me at least every week, if not every other week. A nine for sure every single week. An eight for sure every other week. A seven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to base it on their personality. I'm going to base it on their life. I'm going to base it on you know, how much I'm frustrating them. Now, will I have a ranking with numbers that say one, two, three, and four? Absolutely, 100%. But just kind of take the same principle and use some months. A four is somebody who's about probably eight months away. A three is probably somebody who's probably, maybe they said a year, but we really don't have a timeline. A two is somebody who said, yeah, once my lease is up in about a year, I'm thinking about buying a home, but I'm not really hearing the actual like, yeah, once my lease is up, this is the year we're doing it. That's a different one, right? Or one is somebody that says, you know what? You can call me and, and I'm going to list my home in the next couple of years because I, I can't stay at this job and, and I know they're going to move me up or if they don't move me up, I'm going to get another job somewhere. That's probably a one or a two, but they still are lead. They're still raising their hand, right? But a one, I'm just going to have them on my lead list because I want to see their name and I want to know and understand that they're not just my database. They're a database and a lead. That makes sense? But I don't think I'm going to call them. I'm going to let the, 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 uh, the sphere of influence touch program that I have, the 42 touch system, I'm just going to let that ride with them. I'm not even going to call them to follow up as a lead. I'm just gonna call them to follow up as a database member. Threes, I might call them as a lead maybe once every other month. Four, same thing. Uh, it's up to me and it's up to that situation. But see, that's why you, you, you really can't get excited. You can get, you can get, you can be happy about a lead, but I don't know if I get my hopes up or get super excited if they're a five. And that, and Jerry, the people that don't have timelines and tell you that they're six months out, they're a five to me. So that way I mm -hmm. don't have to spend a bunch of brain space on getting my hopes up. That's it. Hope is a large brain space suck. Hate to say it. So you wouldn't put a five on your whiteboard. You just leave your fives and below in your commands so that that reminds you to stay in contact with them. So I, I have, so I have a rule of thumb. My whiteboard has to be full at all times. I will swap people out if they're a one because I got, or if they're a five, I will swap them out with the six, seven, eights, and nines. Oh. But if I have a full board of seven, eights, and nines, I don't have any sixes on there. But if I have one, seven, eight, or nine, I might have a bunch of four, fives, and sixes on there. So I swap them. I want my board full at all times because it, it's a constant reminder of how much money I am going to make or how much money I'm not going to make. To look at my whiteboard, 
and see fours and fives and no nobody even getting close to a seven, eight, and nine, I got to get on the phones. I got to get to work. So I have a master list or I'm sorry, a master pipeline just like this on my computer. So I basically had my assistant go through and make this graphic on uh, Excel. It doesn't have any of these because I just know in my head, it just simply has this grid. So you guys can do it in 20 seconds, but it's in my Google Sheets. So that way, no matter what computer I go to, I can always do it. And then once a month, I have a calendar entry that usually says, hey, look, just look at your pipeline. Because just because it's on my computer doesn't mean I actually look at it. That's why I love the whiteboard in my face telling me how shitty or how well I'm doing in my business. And that whiteboard, I want to be full. So the first, the first nice invigorating step is having it be blank and watching yourself lead generate and adding people to it. It's, it's, it makes you feel way more fulfilled than just adding them to your, to your command. In my world, you guys got to figure out what works for you. Does that answer? So every single lead I have is on an electronic pipeline. Everybody that is higher up the, the ranks from one to 10 is on my whiteboard until I deplete my whiteboard. But that's why I got those, those pieces of tape because you can always erase and your tape doesn't erase. You don't have to recreate the grids. And you know, I started off with 10. I wanted 10 people on my whiteboard. And then I realized I had an ambition of closing one house a week. So I wanted to close 50, 50 deals a year or 52 deals a year. Well, that means that I need about three to four, eight, nines, and tens on my board at any given time, which means I need more than 10 leads on my whiteboard to focus on and work and, and work through. So then I, I basically, I had too big of a grid, took off some tape and put up 20. Because you can write small and you can still see it. Um, so it's up to you how your whiteboard looks, but I would encourage a pipeline. It really helps your mind get away from getting your hopes up. Because you yes, have to label. And I hear you, you're talking about like kind of startling or startling, starting small with this and building it up. Yeah, like start with that 10. Um, one thing that really has been helpful that I, you've told me before is ultimately though, if you really want to be to the point, like you said, where you're closing deals every single month, so Candice, me, this is for anyone that wants to close deals every month, get it to the point where you have 50 listing leads and 50 buyer leads. Your pipeline needs to be 100 people long, and then you can divide it into listings and buyers, but you need to have 50-50, you know, which is going to take you time to get up to. So that's why you start small, try to get to 10 and 10, 20 and 20, yep. but um, it's a, so important. I, I like that you said that I don't want to scare anybody on here. But if you have an ambition of closing one house a week on average, you have to have 50 buyer leads and 50 seller leads. I, that was the only, when I actually, so three years in a row, I hit 50 closings. And um, I recognize that the, those three years, I had more than 50 on each side uh, as far as leads go. In this market, Gosh, you probably almost have to have almost 75 to 100 listing leads. Who cares if they're a one, two, or three? You still need about 100. Because it's weird when you start to grade them. It's wild how lopsided the weights get. Your pipeline will always have or should always have a ton. I love my pipeline to have a ton of two, three, fours, and fives. Because if I follow up with them, it gives me a reason to call. It gives me a phone number to call to fill my time with. And I watch them work themselves through that process. You guys ever wanted to do something in your life that you never really just set aside the time to do, but there was an outside catalyst that kind of caused you to do what you wanted to do sooner than you would have done on your own? And the, and the biggest example that I can give is just home improvement stuff. When I want to, uh, let me give you an example. I actually have a really cool example right now. Um, I wanted to redo my, my kitchen. I wanted to paint the cabinets. I wanted to redo the hardware and I wanted to get new countertops and just give it a facelift. I wasn't doing that by myself. And then I heard, uh, I don't know if he's on here. I heard Carson on here and Carson said that he, 
uh, does countertops. And uh, Chad says he does flooring. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to put this out there. When can I schedule a meeting with you guys to come over to my house and look at the flooring and the countertops? We got to apologize to Chad. We decided just not to do the flooring. Um, but because I was going to do the countertops and I picked them out and I, they were on order and Carson was texting me about it, I needed to get the cabinets painted. I needed to do some things. And that caused that, he, that was the catalyst that caused me to start moving, right? You guys have to be that catalyst for somebody that wants to buy or sell a home, especially when they don't have any timeline. They have the motivation, they have the idea, they have the excitement, but without a timeline, they're, they're gonna be hard to create that timeline themselves. So you have to create it. And that's what that pipeline does. It's living, it's breathing. Let me talk to you guys about this because I think we've only talked about making sure people go from like a two to a three and a three to a four and a four to a five and a six and a six to a seven. You guys, this is a living thing. Do we have up and down days? Yeah, we go up and we go down. Everything that lives does that. So our whiteboard will do the same. So again, be careful getting any amount of hopes up. Just because you say that they're an eight, doesn't mean they're going to call you with some bad news and tell you, and then basically you're going to have to treat them as a five now. So things can go down too, but it's living, it's breathing. And to have a database or a, a, a pipeline of 50, you know, even if you just did 25 and 25 buyers and sellers, it's a living thing. It's cool to watch it move and, and ebb and flow. And if you guys can get that piece down, that's what helped me look at it and work it and make it breathe and make sure that I wasn't convincing myself that that buyer appointment that I set at two o'clock on Saturday with Ricky without qualifying him, he's an eight. But then I get to that meeting and he drops himself down to a freaking four like that, right? So that's qualification. We have questions. We have a pipeline, all right? Now let's continue, all right? We already went over this, probably should just scroll. You guys notice how all of those questions were things that I asked? There's a buyer lead sheet. I don't necessarily do this to pre-qualify, but they're, they're huge. They give you some cheats. Actually, I didn't realize it was a second page. Yeah, this is the one that's awesome. So download Ignite. Pages uh, 22 and 21, it looks like. And there's your buyer lead sheet. Just do a, do a print PDF and then PDF only those two pages. And then you can print just those. You don't have to print this whole material, but you can start using these. Hey, Bruce, I have a question. Is, um, hey, sorry, uh, is uh, that on our shared like Google Drive for our productivity coaching under buyers? No, great. Great question. You were late to the party this morning. Gosh, I'm so sorry. Nah, <laughs> you're good. I, issues. <laughs> I, 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 I was I a joke. little late. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this is what this is. All interactive. Besides that, Candace needs reminding. I mean, Chad, gosh, he forgets everything I tell him. So okay. you're gonna go to KW Connect some way, shape, or form. I I my habit is to go through my kw.kw.com. You're gonna click on ignite, first page. Then you're gonna get click on this tab material. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna find we are on session six. No. Sorry, we're on session seven. Find and win buyers. There's a lot of stuff in here. So if you want to print off your buyer intake form without the red lettering that you just saw on mine, you're gonna to want to download the student one. Mm. Okay. So you're gonna to want to download. That's French student. Here we go. Student V version 4.17 PDF number seven. We're going to download this one. And then that will have that in there. And then all you do is hit print. And then when it says, what number of pages would you like to spend? You hit custom and then just do those pages. And then that's the only thing that will print so that we don't have to print the whole packet just to get what you want. Okay. Thanks. That's a lot of information. I don't think I've ever seen that page. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, sorry to say that. That's why you get on these. It's okay. Don't be sorry. There's <laughs> you got. I have eight years of knowledge in my head. There's no way we're going to be able to get it out on every session with everybody in some session. Give yourself some grace. That's why you ask these questions and never feel bad about asking. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, I, I'm glossing over this because this has kind of changed the pipeline. We went to a one through 10 versus an A through C because agents were still not defining their leads correctly and getting their hopes up and bombarding leads. You do not want to call a lead who's six months out every week, no matter how excited they are, they will get, they will get sick of you. There's the difference between pre-qualification and pre-approval. Steps for the mortgage, yada, yada, yada. See how much of this was all that qualification stuff? That's why we hit so hard on it, you guys. All right. Now, we're, before we dive into some of the buyer's consultation, I want to share with you guys one of the number one things, and this is an action item for you guys to do. You guys, most of you guys had to do this when you first started with us. What I've learned is I have to go do some research. So for all of you guys on here that took the DISC profile through Tony Robbins, they, they now make you pay for the results. I'm going to task myself with finding a DISC profile test or assessment that is free again. Now, you don't, what we're about to talk about, you do not need to take it. You, I want you to educate yourself and learn it. So one of the best explanation um, websites is the same one um, that we used to have the test on. This one just caught my eye, what is this profile? Oh yeah, this is pretty high level. We might use this for today's class. Yes, all right, we're gonna use this. However, I'm going to try and find, so this was the old one. So anybody that's new, anybody that's going through the Google Classroom right now, the old one was uh, Tony Robbins. And it was free. I, I was just told that it's no longer free and that you have to pay for it. It looks, so far, it looks like it's free. I'll, anyways, I'll check in on it. But your action item for this week is to is maybe even take four weeks. Dive into one of these acronyms heavily this week or all four. Depends on how you retain. Depends on how, how well I'm going to articulate this right here. I love the DISC profile. It's not that I like profiling. It's really not that I like assessment tests. I can't really stand something, somebody to give me a 20-question quiz to tell me who I am and then be crazily spot on, kind of freaks me out. But I love knowing who's on the other side of the table. I do love knowing who I am too, but I like who's knowing on, I like who I know on the other side of the table, meaning the other agent, the seller, the buyer that I'm working with, the lender that I work with, the title company, yada, 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 Nick, so on and so forth, right? People in my database, I need to know who they are. And the DISC profile I have found, there's a lot of assessments out there. I have found it's the most basic to begin your learning. I'm, I'm going to be learning one called the Enneagram. And that one has like nine levels with everybody having two different things. And so it's a little bit more complicated, right? This is four different things that somebody could be D, I, S, or C. So we're going to go through these and we're going to go through some examples. We're going to go through the pros and cons. We're going to go through um, uh, some funniness around it, I guess, if you will. I'm going to try and make this light. If you are this person, and I'm looking at you, Casey Osborne, don't be offended by whatever I say, all right? Because I'm going to go to extreme levels so you actually paint the picture of who these people are. But I want you to understand that somebody can be a high D but not show any sort of signs of extreme this way or this way. Does that make sense? I laugh at Casey because she's one of my favorite personalities. Not. <laughs> I'm rough on you, right? I'm rough. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. Casey's personality is one of the roughest for my personality. But it's not that I don't like Casey. 
is that I'm going to roll my eyes at Casey. I'm going to, you're going to see me do this with Casey. <laughs> Pause, time out, shut your mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did it to Ricky too. He's a high eye. Um, I kid, but knowing who's on the other side of the table, it was really important, right? I personally have this stress ball of anxiety that just festers up through me when I have a high eye on the other side of the table. Because I know I need to let them speak. But I also need to challenge my ears to continue to listen and not check out. Because for me, well, we'll, we'll get into me in a little bit here. A high D. A high D, I like to say, you, you, is synonymous with type A personality. This high D is very bullet pointed. They're very, they're very um, much direct, dominant, to the point. I think of D as a driver. Think of D as a decision maker. A D as somebody who, well, yeah, those are the best ways to describe a high D. Now, that, there's some pros and cons to each one of these personalities. So a D is dominant, direct, and to the point. So the, the, the pro to that type of personality is they make a decision and they're on with their day. A high D is, is proven to be more effective in their time allowance than some of the other personalities because they don't care about half of the stuff. They just, they go right to the important things, make a decision, move on. Go right to the important things, make a decision, move on. They don't, there's not a lot of time analyzing. There's not a lot of time reading paragraphs upon paragraphs. You guys ever hear of speed reading? Somebody just told me about this because I don't read books because I cannot stand the fluff. Even though it's like a story, I can't stand building the background. Just tell me that Rick and um, you know Sheila are in love. Just, just, <laughs> just literally say that in the book versus being like, well, Rick and Sheila you know, their eyes caught each other and they went out to dinner and there's this big, long chapter about how they fell in love. No, just tell me they fell in love and let me get on with the story. So for me, I have a hard time reading books, but somebody told me to speed read and I like speed reading now. I read the first sentence of the paragraph and the last sentence of the paragraph. And that usually will get me what I need from that paragraph without even having to read it. If it doesn't, maybe I should read that paragraph. But for the most part, it does. I can just start to skim the book and read it and understand it at a high level. I'm not going to understand all the details. I'm not going to understand what Sheila was wearing on her first date with Rick. I'm not going to understand that. But I'm going to understand they're in love. And that's all I'm going to need to know. Why do you think, uh, uh, what do you think some cons are of a D? Who's, who in here has gotten frustrated at me? So apparently I'm a high D. I'm just going to give you that one. Every single one of you should have gotten frustrated with me at some point in time. I get frustrated with myself. I will literally give you guys an answer very quickly and very bluntly and very abruptly. Get off the phone, continue doing what I'm doing. And now that like my, my, my calm has set in, I go, oh man, I hope I didn't offend them by just spouting that off to them. I didn't mean to. They just caught me at a type A moment, Right. Um, so a con to a D is that they look like a dick. <laughs> they can come off as abrasive, blunt, um, completely. Can you guys still hear me? My earbuds. How about now? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes. They can come off as demanding, demeaning, disrespectful, and they might not even recognize it at that moment. A high D's biggest con is that they, when they want to be, you know, direct and to the point and, and set the standard right then and there, they will, but they don't really realize when they're being insensitive. A high D has a hard time with emotions. Um, they don't feel, they don't, there's no sympathy with a high D. There very well may be some empathy, but with a high D, your feelings and emotions, they just don't care about 
they might care about it, but they're not going to show it. That's, that's the way to put it. I care about people's emotions and feelings. I'm probably just not going to show it. And that's a detriment to me. I got to learn how to do that. Does everybody understand the high D? That's usually the one that's really easy to understand. Okay, let's put it in the real world application of real estate. When you see somebody who's a driver, a high D, when you sit down with them and, and they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And they're basically saying, they're basically going like this, like, get on with it, get on with it. Okay, get rid of the fluff in your consultation. A high D does not care about your references and referrals and your, and your accolades. A high D doesn't care how many homes you've sold. A high D does not give a crap about the weather, birds, sunshine, rainbows, and mountains. They want to meet you with you for a reason. They want you to educate them, and they want to start the process. So when I have a very high D, a very high driver, my buyer consultation, that's usually an hour and a half to two hours, instantly is about 45 minutes because I'm trying to read the room. They don't want that. Okay. When you are lead generating and you get somebody on the phone, whether it's an open house lead, a cold call, a sphere of influence member or something like that, or door knocking, this is my favorite. You knock on the door and you get that person that opens up the door about an inch and goes, yeah, pick up on their high D, get to the freaking point. It's not, hey, what's going on? My name is Bruce and I'm with Keller Williams Realty and I'm out here today. No, you have just frustrated the, the, the living daylights out of that person. Hey, what's going on? I'm sorry to bother you. I'm actually advertising our open house. It's going to be down the street on Saturday from 11 to 2. Who do you know that's looking to buy a home in this neighborhood? You see, I know the whole script, but all I did was pick out the bullet points and set them. Right? Same thing with a high D and a consultation. You've got to get in, get out, get on. But be careful being offended by a high D. I joke when I say who's been offended by me, because if I don't have this conversation with you guys right now, you don't know I'm a high D and you guys will think that I'm frustrated with you. I'm not frustrated with anybody, really. Um, I only get frustrated with, yeah, I don't really get frustrated, actually. I only get frustrated with traffic and people in grocery stores. Those are my pet peeves. An I. Let's talk about the high eyes. Do you want to talk about them, Kent? Do you want to talk about them, Casey? Uh, oh yeah well we're rough on a lot of people I i'm just say. kidding <laughs> i was like it's perfect it really it describes me to a t which is so funny but i mean i could go on forever you don't want me to start talking about anything <laughs> i know you could you're a high eye <laughs> no but yeah. um i i joke right casey and ricky are high eyes all right um, they, you know, I learn that, you know, most of the time when I pick up the phone with them, they're going to, they're going to spend a few minutes painting the picture for me before they jump into the reason why they called. So if I see them, if I see their name come up on my phone, I have to think about my time because if I have only a couple of minutes, I'm going to sound like an, I'm going to sound like a, like a dick to them. Because I'm going to pick up the phone. And I'm going to go, hey, Casey, uh, can we cut right to it? I've only got about a couple minutes. And what she wants, what a high eye wants to hear is, hey, Casey, what's going on today? How can I help? Calm, cool, collective. Right? Same thing with Ricky. It's nothing against them. I just know that they're going to take a couple of minutes to talk about it. Now, when I have a high D call me and I'm a high D, some high Ds need to explain more to me to, for me to help them than they realize they need to explain, right? But so a high I, let's just go over that. A high I is an influencer. They are the people not afraid to talk about them, the other person on the other side, the weather, the, the real estate market. They're, they're not afraid to, to, to find a leaf on the ground and have a 20 minute conversation around how leaves are cool. Um, they will, they're so energetic. They're so enthusiastic. You know, there's not too many times that you get on these calls with uh, people like Ricky and Casey and you don't see facial expressions come out, right? She, Casey is constantly, I can, when she's thinking, she has a face for a thinking face. 
When she's excited, yep. When she's excited, she smiles. When she is talking and gets a little bit wondering about her, uh, when she when she starts to try and figure out what she's gonna say next, you should watch her eyelashes. They like they flutter like this. So what I'm getting at is a high eye wears their emotions on their sleeves over and over and over and over again. That's how you can kind of tell. Now a high eye also. Um, uh, well, so those are the those are the pros to a high eye. They have no problem. Ricky and Casey have no problem. If I gave them each a different 10 digit number, a phone number right now on this call. And I said, hey, guys, put yourself on mute. Call this number and lead generate. They may or may not know what to say, but both of them would get their phone out and call. They just would. They absolutely don't care. Now they might dial the phone number and then go, <gasps> I'm not prepared and the phone's ringing. High eyes, they do make decisions quick too. Sometimes without thinking, sometimes with some thought, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So we got the pros. The pros are high eyes, I'm envious of. Because when I say go lead generate, they go, how many people? How do I do that? Okay, I got it. Let me go do that. They just go do it. High eyes, I have to kind of wrangle them back in and say, hey, did you order your business cards? Hey, have you got people in your database yet? Right? So there's a, the, the con to a high eye is what? They're not, really, they're not very detail oriented on a natural state. Now, I know some of you, so the cool part about a high eye is, is they might have a secondary person. Everybody has two of these. So I'm a D as well as something else. Casey is a high I as well as another D, I, S, or C, okay? We all have two. Some of us has three, and the rare people have four, meaning rare people have, are, have a, a personality that hits every single one of these. Uh, a slightly rarer person is somebody who has three of these. Most people have two, and some people have one. So, when I'm talking about high eyes not being detail oriented, you could be a high eye and detail oriented because I know that's who Casey is. Um, Ricky's a high eye, but I don't think he's very detail oriented. And it's not against Ricky, but it's not for Casey either. What it is, is we need to know our weaks and our strengths and that's what this does. So a high eye, they're the, they're the class clown. They're the influencer. They're the person who interrupts people like me. When they have a question, they want to say it. So a high I, one of their cons is they, over, they talk over people or they want to in situations. A high I will talk about themselves and not really realize and get carried away. Um, a high I has a hard time reading the room. When a high I gets with a driver like me, they can get all nervous and clammy because I don't speak. I, don't, I like bullet points and I look like I'm probably glossing over. I look like I'm checking out. And what they do is they go into fight or flight and their fight is I'm going to talk more. I'm bugging this guy. So I'm going to talk and I'm going to talk in circles and now I'm nervous. And now I just, my mouth just keeps running. Just calm down, relax, right? Open your ears and, and relax and, and understand that the person on the other side of the table isn't necessarily a high eye. If they are a high eye, man, they're going to be two peas in a pot. You know, if Casey gets in a room with Ricky, they're probably going to sit down for an hour long mastermind. It's going to turn into five. It's no, that's not right or wrong. It's just what it happens. Right. So a high eye has to manage their time. Right. Casey probably can get caught up in a lot of different things and go, what the heck did I do today? Right. She needs a to do list. She needs this. Why are you laughing? I just, I feel like you're, you just know me and it's so funny because that's exactly right. Like I just, I mean, unless I have a to-do list, like the time can just go away. Like I'll forget, I'll lose the time. So I don't know. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so yeah, a high eye has to watch their time, their time management. A high eye is likely to go, from a buyer who wants to see, hey, hey, Casey, here's nine houses we'd like to see this weekend. 
yes, let's get going. We'll see some on Saturday and we'll see some on Sunday. I'll let you know what's scheduled. I'm so glad you got back to me. Does she really, is she really, does she really need to, to, to spend the time showing all those houses? Maybe, maybe not, right? But a high eye might not look into it. They might just take it and start setting up all nine versus actually looking at the properties and weeding out some of the ones she knows her buyers are not going to like. Okay. So pros and cons, everybody got a high eye? Cool. A high S. Um, this is the one that's a little bit more calm. Um, they're very loyal. They're very uh, much a people pleaser. You can call this person the, the family man. Um, this person, here's the number one kind of sentence for a high S. They make decisions based upon other people's actions and emotions and decisions. Have you ever seen a couple, and maybe you're this couple, go, hey, honey, what do you want to eat tonight? I don't care, honey. It's, it's up to you. No, seriously, everything sounds good to me. What, what, do you, what do you want? Yeah, I kind of in the same boat. Like everything kind of sounds good to me. And you know, um, you know, maybe we should just, maybe we should just stick with our, our, and they're, they're about to say normal or stick with this. And they're waiting for the other person to have an opinion. So high S's love when other people drive them. A high D can take control of a high S like that. Because a high S wants to be led. They want to be, they want to remain calm. They don't want to be the spotlight. They don't want to be the person that makes the decision because if that decision is the wrong decision, they don't want to let people down. Remember, they make decisions based upon everybody else's interactions, decisions, and, and things. So the one, one of the best ways I know how to find a high S in a room is when you ask a question that's kind of controversial they were not going to raise their hand until somebody else is in that group with them. So if you ask a, if you ask a group of people a question, what do you think comes first, the chicken or the egg? If you think the chicken, raise your hand. And they think the chicken, but they're not going to raise their hand until somebody else raises their hand first. Because they're going to be embarrassed to be the only one that thinks the chicken came before the egg. You guys see that? Even if they think the chicken came before the egg and nobody else in the room raises their hand and says the chicken came before the egg, they're probably likely to raise their hand when everybody else raises their hand around the egg, but they're still going to wait for everybody else to raise their hand. That's how much an extreme high S can be. They don't make decisions very well. They run in circles. They're procrastinators. Um, they love to be led. They love to be led. Do you, you guys have friends that are couples or, or maybe even not a couple, just a single person who just, just seems like they're all over the place. They don't really have any one hobby. They don't really have any one passion. They kind of like to do what their friends like to do, but none of what they actually do is stuff that they've introduced to their friends group and stuff like that. That's a high S. The cool part about a high S is they can be led. They trust you, usually faster than all the other personalities. If you notice a high S, uh, be careful, be careful steamrolling them. If you're a high S and you're an agent on the other end of my deal, be careful because I'm going to steamroll you. I'm gonna make I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up on your high S and I'm gonna ask you questions that make you feel clammy. I'm going to make you feel so clammy that you're going to start answering my questions, even though you said you weren't going to. A high S, I can play. If, if, if you get on the phone with me and my sellers don't want me to say what price the highest offer is at, I'm going to, get, I'm going to put my driver on and I'm going, to be, I'm going to say, no, I can't give you that. And Carson's going to say, well, can we play the hot and cold game? Can you, know, can you tell me if an offer is at least over 525? And I'm going to say, what did I just tell you? I'm not even going to get you close due to my client's decision. A high S, you can say, hey, can you tell me where the highest offer is? And the high S personality is going to go, well, actually, you know, my, my, my clients would really rather me not say. 
Um, but what other questions do you have? Well, hey, we might not be able to tell me exactly what the highest offer is, but can we just play the hot and cold game? And then you're not going to go around your seller's back and, and, and say something you didn't want them to say. But my buyers, we really want to make a good offer on this house. Can you just humor me? Is it over 525? Just, just tell me yes or no. I won't even ask you another question after that. Yeah, we, do, we, we have one over that. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. I do have another question. Like, is it, is it a lot over that? Bruce, I really, I'm going too far right now. I just want to know because my buyers were thinking like five, 535. Don't tell me, but are we in the running at that? Yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd be in the running at that. Oh, so it sounds like we're not the highest at that. Well, no, there's one other person that's a little higher than you. Okay, great. Thank you for your time. I'll, I'll be sure to send over a contract. Now, how would you like to be communicated with? Would you like me to email you and the offer and then text you or just email you? Or would you like me to email it to you and then call you? Right, Let, now I'm letting the high S make a decision, but it's a quick decision for them because they do have a, they do have a preference right there. You see how I can, I can beat up a high S a little bit, but a driver, they're just going to shut you down. And if they shut you down quickly, you're probably not going to just continue to ask questions because now you're going to be afraid you're going to what? Frustrate them. So if you are on the listing side of things in this market, I would encourage you to put your driver hat on. Even if you don't register as a high D when you take this assessment, use it. Okay. Um, I think we talked about all the pros and cons to a high S. I, personally, a high S, I don't feel like there's a, a, a huge amount of pros and I don't think there's a huge amount of cons. The biggest con is that they can't make decisions very quickly, but they'll make decisions quickly as long as they have a driver in their life that's making decisions. Um, the, the biggest con, I, I mean, that's the biggest con. The biggest um, uh, thing about a high S that I think is a pro is that they care about others. They, they, they care about others more than any of the other personalities. The other thing about a high S that I kind of like and, and I would classify as a nice pro is no matter how high they are on themselves and how much money they make, how much they know, how, much, how experienced they are in life, they're going to be humble about it. Questions so far? All right, a high C, high C. This is, uh, I, I think of a high C, I just, I, when my brain goes engineer type, they need data, they need analytics. They absolutely pride every decision they make on it being the best statistical calculation. That's why, that's why engineers typically are high Cs. They like all that data. They like to put those things together. A high C also uh, very much likes to be independent with their research. They don't trust other people. If, if, if I tell a high C that the market did seven, a 17% gain in um, equity last year and they don't believe me, they're probably gonna go do their own research and find out, or they're gonna validate what I said. A high I is gonna believe me all day long. I'm gonna tell a high I that, that uh, we went up 17% in the market and they're gonna go, holy crap, that's like, that's full on truth and that's the Bible and that's what I'm going to use. A high D is going to go, great, thanks for the information. They might not use the word 17%, but they believe you that it went up a lot. So they're going to use words like, yeah, I heard that the market you know, went up a pretty good amount. They might not use the word 17% because they probably didn't hear you and they probably just glossed over it. A high S is going to go, well, that's kind of interesting. What does that mean that the market went up 17%? How do, what, do I, what does that mean for me? How do I use that? You're making me scared. Do I need to make a decision? A high C is going to validate. They're going to go. They're going to go on the Denver Post and see if they can find stats to validate that. They want details. They will not make a decision unless they have all the facts and details. So much like a high S can be a stable person and still a procrastinator at, at moments. They're not going to procrastinate if somebody tells them a deadline. If you tell a, a high S 
I can tell how all of you guys are high S's because when I say, hey, interact with this Facebook page and you do, it's because you cared about what I had to say. Um, I can tell a high S in this room when I ask somebody to volunteer and nobody's volunteering. A high S goes, I do kind of have something to say. I don't know if I want to say it. I don't want to be wrong, but nobody's saying something. I want to help the, I want to help the instructor out. He asked for a volunteer. Okay. They're always the last one to raise their hands. They're always the last one to raise their hands. Um, but still, staying on C, sorry. Um, got to be accurate. They got to be the expert. They got to have everything sound. The con to a high C is that they, they don't make decisions very quickly. They have to have all the data. A high C, I have the, hard, the hardest time out of all these profiles, I have the hardest time getting to lead generate. Let me say that again. If you are a high C and some of this stuff that we're talking about is hitting the nail on the head, you might want to consider looking into your other, your other uh, personality profile and using that to your strength, getting in that mindset when you lead generate. Because here's what I, here's the number one, here's the number one reason why a, um, not the number one, here's multiple reasons why a high C does not lead generate. Not because they're not willing to, it's just because they don't have all the data. I don't know what to say. Can you help me practice that script? I haven't practiced that script. This script doesn't sound like me. Can we find one that sounds like me? Um, oh my gosh, I just set a buyer's consultation for four days from now and I got to get ready. You have four days. What? Why are you freaking out? Like you have four days. I'm a driver. I start freaking out about 20 minutes before when I realize I forgot that I had the appointment. <laughs> Um, they, they very much like their own world. Um, I think somewhere in here, I should say independent. Yeah. Independent. They like their own world. Their world is their world. Their numbers, stats, plan is that's their end all be all. If you try and introduce something else to them, they're going to get clammy. They're going to get, they're going to get frustrated. They like all the data. If you want a high uh, or high C to make an offer, they want data. So figure out what's important, what data is important to them and make sure you provide that to them when you're showing them a house, right? So whenever I walk into a house with a high C, I say, hey, look. So on this one, we have three bedrooms upstairs, one bedroom downstairs, pretty, pretty open floor plan built in 1969. So we are gonna need a lead-based paint disclosure form. And it's about 2,700 square foot. Anything else you want to know about this property as you look around, just let me know. They have all that data, but they like the assurance that I'm, I'm confirming what they saw to be true on a piece of paper online. The other hard part about a high C is they, they tend to not have a big voice. They, they tend to not talk a lot. Um, a high S will get into a conversation. And as long as that conversation, as long as they can relate to the other side, they'll have a conversation all day. Uh, a high I, they don't really care about the, the topic. They, they'll figure out a way to make, to, they'll figure out a way to talk about a, a, a tree limb for 20 minutes. A high D, They'll stay in conversation, but there's not going to be a lot of responses. There's not going to be a lot of conversation. It's going to be a lot of bullet points. It's going to be a lot of questions. But a high C, they just don't like conversations. They don't like hugs. You'll know a high C when somebody doesn't even want to shake your hand. They just kind of want to, they want to do a COVID distant thing. That's a high C for sure. Questions on the disc profile. Cool. Let's, uh, let's. Let's do this a little bit. Um, let me go. I saw one of these. Okay, cool. All right. Remember when I was saying that um, we have some different personality types. All right. Most of the uh, most of the the the, the disc kind of uh, charts like this will go D I S and C. They'll be in a quadrant like this, and there's a reason for that. 
So we talked about the pros and cons to the extremes of those personalities. But I also said that everybody has two of these personalities for the most part. It's very rare if you only have one. And it's very rare if you have all four. 90% of people, I can't remember the exact stat, but it's like high 80s, 90% of people have two of these. About 5% have all three and then one and 1% on the, the other side where they have all four or just one. But it, this goes even further. So let's just talk about people that traditionally have two because that's usually 90% of this room. Chances are, if you are a dominant high D, your secondary is a high I or a high C. So they follow each other. They, they're always right next, they're usually right next to each other. So if you're a high I, chances are KC is not a high C. Chances are she's a high S or a high D. Chances, she could jump. So these are, you know, let's just call them jumpers. She could be a jumper. Um, a, a, high, a high S, same thing. They're usually a high SI or an IS or a CS or a C uh, or an S I, uh, or an SC. The reason why I take the, the, them and change them is because we usually have a dominant and then a subdominant or a subordinate. So if you're a high S, that could be your strength. And then your, your, your secondary personality could be a high I which allows you to talk to people, which allows you to engage and interact. But because each one has different pros and cons, you guys need to figure out what their dominant stance is, know the pros and cons of them, and then figure out what your sub is and use the strength of your sub, use the strength of your sub to mitigate the cons of your dominant. Let me give you an example. So. A high DI, right? The dominant personality is the D, the driver. So what are their cons? Their cons are that they're, they're insensitive. They're quick. They're, they jump to the point. They don't really show empathy. They don't really show sympathy or feelings or emotions. Well, a high I does. They live in their emotions. So the one con or the one pro over here can outweigh this con. And sometimes this person has to say, all right, you're pretty direct right now. You need to calm down before you go in this meeting. All right, we need to put our high eye hat on. We need to, we need to be, we need to be engaging in this meeting. We need to talk. We need to, we need to do this. They have pep talks with themselves, right? And they go in that meeting. And the first thing a high eye does is to get in that get in that engagement mode is, hey, what's going on, everybody? Come here, give me a hug, man. It's been a long time. And then they're getting their energy through that through being loud and bringing up the, the, the energy in the room and giving hugs and, you know, like in Casey's world, she bat her eyes and, you know, smirking and doing all this stuff. That's what gets her going. So then she can almost take away the con of a high D. You see that? You need to use your strengths to mitigate the weakness of the and or. And they almost all do that. So a high C is usually a high CD or a CS. A high S is usually a high I or high C. The reason why I test high in a, in a coaching capacity is because most people aren't DSs or SDs. I don't really have a lot of I and I don't really have a lot of C. I'm very unorganized, right? It's awesome that I even have a roster for the productivity coaching program. It's awesome, but I don't make it because I would never make it and I would never set this out of time to do it because I don't like spreadsheets. I hate spreadsheets. I barely can track my numbers. The reason why I track my numbers is because my high driver says I am the best business owner I ever have shown myself. And because I need to be the best business owner, I need to have some sort of detail tracking. So I need to figure out a way to track. What do I want to track? When I coach, when I mentor, when I train, I'm very much in a high S standpoint. That's why I will always say, hey, look, ask me questions over and over and over and over and over again. You cannot frustrate me. But sometimes when you guys ask questions over and over again, I might just be over here. And that's when you might get a very direct answer. 
that seems like I'm frustrated that you asked. I'm not, I'm just simply in a mode. I'm in, I'm in lead generation. I'm doing something. I'm in the middle of something. I'm negotiating. I got to get off to an appointment. That's all it really means. Casey, do you believe you're a high IS? Uh, no, I'm a, a high ID. <laughs> you're a high ID? Okay, that's good. Yeah. Cool. But, um, yeah. Ricky, what are you? You're a high IS? I was going to say, I think I'm more high IS. Cool. I know. So as I get to know you guys uh, more and more, I'll probably be able to pick you guys out. Jerry, you are an extremely high S. Pretty much can figure that one out. You really care about people, man. You really, you're there. You're attentive. You're on time. You do not want to screw up. Um, Carson, you are probably likely a very dominant driver. I think you got a hot, a high D. I don't know your secondary. Maybe C. You're pretty detail oriented, but you also could be a high S too. Yeah, C S is what it gave me, but I took it Ooh, twice. Ooh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chad. High S, S I, I S. Nope. When I took it, I was high D and followed by I. Oh, yeah. Okay. See, see how long it takes sometimes to get. The reason why I just go through and do that, we're going to finish up here, you guys. Let me make sure that I got more slides. It's funny, Bruce, because I feel like I would be more of a, an I S because. I mean, just in my own mind, I feel like I would be more like a people pleaser and still hard to make decisions. But in my results, it said I was a high, well, a high I and then with some D or something. So I don't know. Actually, I'm one of those rare ones where I was a high D and then an I and then a C. Okay, so Chad was one of the ones in the group that I was wondering if he had maybe two or three. Hmm. Hmm. I fool everybody with being a high I, but you know, I'm I'm real dominant. When I, it's like time to move. We move. <laughs> and for the rest of you that I'm not picking on, I'm just getting to know you guys. Um, the reason why we went over that in such great length, and and I'm gonna skip through some things here, and we're gonna end this piece, is talking about making an offer we talk about um you know talking about the buyer's consultation making an offer negotiating with the other side everything that we just talked about with the disc profile hits here so now just connect those dots all right connect those dots so we are we are with a high d or let's no we're with a high i and we want to we're working with the buyer and they're under contract and you get a call from the inspector and the inspector goes, hey, your clients were here and I, I don't know how to tell them this because I mean, they were all over the place. Like they were running around. They were like, you know, they were like, like mock having a party on the patio. Like they're so in love with this house. Like I, I do not want to be the one to tell them that there's a foundation issue. Right. If I'm a high D and I'm like, OK, like what I'm in the middle of something like, OK, I just need to tell my clients that they need to back out of this property. No problem. Sounds good. Ring, ring. Hey, Casey, what's going on? Hey, the inspector just told me it's on foundation issues. Um, when my inspector calls me, we need to terminate and back out of the contract. That is not the way to talk to Casey. Right. You need to pick up on the personalities that your people are. What I need to do is I need to, I need to, I need to go, hey Bruce, all right. You need to call Casey at a time that you have time. You need to call Casey at a time where you're you're you can articulate what's going on and 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 help her overcome this and get through this. All right, let's call Casey. Ring ring. Hey Casey. Hey, it's Bruce. Hey, um, are you sitting down? Well, actually, I kind of know you're sitting down because the, the inspector said you're on the back patio kind of having a, a, a fake party. Are you drinking beer on the back patio because you're excited about the home? She's going to go, yeah. I'm going to go, hey, well, uh, I need you to put your, your beer down. All right, we got some things to talk through. 
Okay. And I, and I don't want to burst your bubble with this news. You see, he called me because there's something that came up on the inspection that we need to walk, we need to work through, we need to tackle it. It may be something that we can work through, but it also, you need to understand it may be something that we might need to, we might need to give this house up for because it might just be way too much money to fix. And, and now Casey, I, I am talking about, I am, I am talking about the foundation. And that's a big component of the house. And I, I know you love this house. I know you love that backyard. And I know you're excited to have people come over and visit you. But you see, the fact of the matter is, is that as your agent, as your advocate, you know, I really want to make sure that, I really want to make sure that, you know, we don't just buy this house out of excitement. And that five years down the road from now, when you've had umpteen parties, you're not having to put in thirty to $40,000 into the, to the basement. I'm really sorry to burst your bubble right now. Um, let's, 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 let's maybe, you know, think about that for a few minutes, go back. You know, I know this is going to hit you hard and I know you're, you're going to be upset and frustrated. Look at, she's even feeling sad. Look, she's got a sad face on zoom right now. <laughs> right. But that's how much a, a high, a high C will, or, or a half that. A high eye will wear their emotions. So you better wear that sucker with them. I have the hardest time doing that. So I have to pep talk myself. I have to go, look, you don't have to feel sympathy, Bruce, but you do need to show some empathy right here. You don't need to show sympathy, but you need to show some empathy. Hi, Casey. Those are the most painful phone calls for me. I pick on Casey a lot. I pick on Ricky a lot because I can't stand high eyes in business and on the other side. But you know who my best friends are? They're high eyes. I, I friggin' love high eyes. I love going out and partying with you high eyes. You guys will get that thing turned up so quick. God, you saw Ricky karaoke at the bar in Orlando while Jenny Hart was videotaping it. Like, Ricky's a friggin' good time. If you ask Ricky if Bruce is a good time, He's probably not going to say I'm a good time because I, I'm not a high eye. I, I don't sit there and chat with everybody. I'm, I'm at the bar listening. I'm at the bar. You know, I have a high D S I make decisions based upon other people's emotions. And when I need to make a decision for myself I make it very quickly, it's all I really need. I need people in my life, but I, I don't, I'm just going to watch high eyes go do karaoke. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be silently dancing in the background because I don't care. But you guys see what I'm getting at? So to finish up this class, I really want you guys to think about that. Think about all the aspects of the buyer's consultation, of the, you know, negotiations, of, you know, lead qualification. Oh, man, that's a good point to hit, too. So uh, Ricky calls me and says, Bruce, man, I've been getting your newsletter for months. I'm sorry I haven't ever made your, you know, phone call, but... I just got your newsletter about this new briar program that you guys are doing at Keller Williams. And you know, my, my fiance and I, we're, we're starting, to, we're starting to think about buying a home. We're so excited, man. And we found this home online and um, you know, uh, it looks like it hits all of our, our, our pieces of criteria. Uh, the homes at one, two, three main street. Um, you know, we were thinking that, it, it, you know, I'm not sure how this works, but we were thinking that if you have some time this weekend, we'd like to go see this house maybe Saturday. Right. That high eye just overwhelmed the hell out of me. <laughs> Um, you know, so now we got to bring it back in, but I got to be cautious about how I wrangle this back in because Ricky wants to see this house and he's a high eye and he's excited. So, and he just saw a Facebook clip online, right? If you're not careful and you talk to somebody like that, you're going to get excited because what do we talk about before with qualifying buyers? You're going to get excited. You're going to be like, holy crap. I got somebody who wants to go see a house this weekend. Oh, uh, Done. Ricky, what time? Saturday at two? Perfect. Let's roll. Then you're going to get to the house Saturday at two. And one of two things is going to happen because Ricky's a high eye. He's not going to show up because he didn't put it on his calendar because he got all excited. And then he's a high eye, which means he, he doesn't plan well. He forgot. He didn't ask his wife. He didn't, he forgot that his family had plans. Or he's going to show up and he's going to want to see the house, going to go through the house and you go, okay, great, man. I really like this. Yeah. I think I want to buy a house. Okay, cool. Bruce, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And you'll be like, wait, what? I know you wanted to just see the house, but like, 
we we gotta set some expectations here. We gotta we gotta we gotta make some moves. We gotta like, are you serious? Like, do you want to buy a house? Like, and then you're that agent that sits back and goes, "Oh crap, I should have asked him more questions. He's not ready to buy a house. I didn't even ask him. I, we didn't even do a buyer's consultation. Ricky just got me all excited." So do you guys understand why we did so long on the disc profile? I actually teach a completely separate disc profile class, one in which we actually go through the disc profile in way more profound detail. But find and win with buyers and honestly, find and win with sellers. It's, it's all about you being in relation with the person on the other side of the table, the couch, the house, whatever it is. You have to understand who they are. You have to understand how to interact, how to pick up on their mannerisms. Next week, we're going to go through how to find and show homes. And I'm not going to hit the disc profile that hard, but I'm going to bring up the disc profile a lot because the disc profile is the number one reason why I can get buyers to make an offer after about five to seven homes. Okay. So everybody that's on here, I encourage you to look at that this week, take a look at it. And before we jump on next week, understand it because I'm just going to simply Say, hey, when you're showing a house to a high eye, this is what I recommend. You got to know what I'm talking about. Cool. Any questions before we jump off here? That was very high level. And like I said, I kind of take this Ignite class. And this is pretty much what I've, what I've taught to multiple market centers nationwide. Cool. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Bruce.